Welcome to Enlightened Masculinity. I'm your host, Yogi Chris, PhD. Today, continuing with Evolution of Desire. It's very exciting. I have the next book is Mating Mind, and I can tell you that's going to be a doozy. It's going to be really nice. A lot less statistically oriented like this, more psychologically oriented. The first book in the list that you should read if you're interested in this subject, and it's a really fun topic. Uh, he makes it fun. Um, it's called Sperm Wars. The book is called Sperm Wars, and it's an evolutionary psychology book. It's like a textbook, but it's written in a way, very fun introduction to the subject. You'll see like 30 or 40 different human mating strategies, and you're gonna, it's going to ring true. You're going to see that you have really stuck to three or four different strategies throughout your life, and they're already written about. Like they're known, you know, you'll see, and then it makes you more compassionate really for people because you'll see your story played out in other people that we're all living a very similar story. And if for all the other strategies that you don't do, um, you'll know somebody, it'll, it'll resonate with you. You'll know somebody that reminds you of that, or you'll have seen that before, or you'll understand a little bit more why that even turns you on or why it turns you off. Like you, because it's interwoven with some justifications for why in evolutionary history that resulted in surviving offspring or not surviving offspring, which is why we're all here. It's, it's the, the code of attraction. It's reasonable. It's there's reasons why it works. And we're also evolving, you know, it's like we evolve. Um, if you didn't know cauliflower and, and broccoli are actually the same species but we've evolved them differently through what's called artificial selection, which is still natural selection. Natural selection is always happening. But artificial is we came in and we selected this one, but not those. Not for a reason, maybe aesthetics or uh, whatever. Like dogs, you know, it's artificial selection. We do that with everything. And so we're artificially, the man and the woman has actually selected each other throughout time for what was supposed conceived to be either survival or replication value. She's going to give me healthy offspring and she's going to be able to raise them to be healthy and survive. She's looking at him like, I'm going to be secure and provided for and my children, it's going to be safe. And it's the meter she's looking, the direction. She's, she's pointed towards his survival. He's pointed towards his offspring. His progeny is going to go through her. And then you have different time horizons, different contexts. There's different contexts. If we're at, if I'm at war, my mating mind thinks differently than when I'm at peace. So that's going to be mating mind. That's the next book. The current book that I'm re reviewing is uh, Evolution of Desire, which has just a lot of facts. It's just a lot of nuts and bolts about what what you think, what your personal opinion about men and women, your personal opinion about yourself. See, you don't know where you fit in the grand scheme of human behavior until you read about the grand scheme of human behavior. Or I guess you could see it firsthand, but even there, you'll get like this kind of subjective bias where you drop the past. The further in the past it is, the less you consider it, unless it was impactful. So you get more and more biased by what you're viewing now versus when you write it down or you have a big data collection, you can see a lot of historical data also all it's like when you make a business plan or any kind of flow chart, you get a macroscopic view of a bigger system that's a little more challenging to see it when you're up close to it. So that's what evolution of desire is. It's this grand perspective of human nature outside of my opinions about it. This is what the statistics are. And of course, there's, there's all kinds of bias in that. For example, the one guy, it was funny. It was in it. He was like, somehow... He's like, albeit one could imagine the hesitancy of a tribal woman, because they're interviewing tribal women, the hesitancy of a tribal woman to divulge her sexual history to a strange white male anthropologist. Like, so he's there asking her questions or somehow translating or something. So you can imagine people lie on questionnaires. So it's not like there was another book that I don't really recommend, but it was called like A Billion Wicked Lies or A Billion Secrets or something. And these MIT specialists went into Google and saw what people were searching for. And so they looked up people's erotic preferences and that's completely sensor free because there's no hiding it. Now they don't, they can't attach it to who, 
it was, but they can generally say, this is what men are looking for. This is what women are looking for. When there's, when there's no opinions, when you, when you're not changing what you're saying, when you can't lie, you know? Uh, so that's not evolution of desire. That, that was, that whole book, it was a thick book. That's the only thing I got from it. So that's why I don't recommend reading it. But, um, you know, the mating minded, then we'll move on to red queen effect, which will bring us to present time. And okay, so let's go to the notes here. So we stay on task. You going to Trader Joe's today? Maybe Trader Joe's. So in the basic, it keeps coming back to pater ensuring paternity versus uh, ensuring resource commitment. That's like the male female in the human species. He can't prove that that's his kid. So he has all these mate guarding tactics to basically have her on lockdown. Have her womb on lockdown. He can't. He doesn't know when she's ovulating. And the only way to prove that it's his kid is because he knows she's had no access to any guys in that window of a few months when she would have gotten pregnant. That that would time up with his kid. Four or five months. Like, what's the window, really? Once she gets pregnant, you know she can't get pregnant again. But, like, who was she around in that month or two? I don't know how pregnant she is, really. Depends on how lean she is and how, how much weight she gains during pregnancy. Like, so he just can't ensure it, but that's like an 18 year sentence. That's an 18 year rape and pillage of his wallet and bank account and life. He's going to die earlier. You know, he dies earlier than her. He dies more likely at every age by accident. And he has a shorter lifespan years, days, you know, at the end, it's going to matter each moment, each hour, if you're around your family or friends, imagine years. He sacrifices himself for her. That's the biological nature. Now, is he sacrificing himself for his offspring, but it's not his? So that happens to like 10, 20%, who knows? Who knows really? Supposedly the numbers increased. It was 10% a long time ago. This is a, that's, that's so damaging to men and masculinity. And of course, the men that are raised, the boys that become men, boys to men. <laughs> so can you imagine like how terrible it is for women to undergo rape? How terrible, it, you could never trick a woman into raising someone else's kid by convincing her it's, it's hers. Unless she was like, what, in a coma when she gave birth or something? Like so rare, that's not a biological thing because in nature, she would just die if she was in a coma like that. She wouldn't have given birth like that and survived to like raise it. So you can't fool a woman into that. You could fool a woman into a deep, dark corner of a building with a little bit of alcohol in her and then take advantage of her. Try to do that to a man, woman, try to do that to a man. So he's not really at risk of that. He's at risk of sacrificing himself for another man's seed. So he's developed all sorts of behaviors. This is where you really start to see human nature come out because humans don't really, we don't like a beaver, like cuts down trees, like bird builds a nest. Humans don't really do anything if they're left to their own, but they do have certain instincts that get triggered in relationships. So mate guarding or jealousy or anger, these things that are really attempts to prevent um, failing at one's mating strategy. Jealousy is a signal. Anger and sadness, these are a signal that your strategy is not going according to plan. You're not getting what you planned on. And that's very, re replication is not to be handled lightly. You know, just because yin female is submissive and male is dominant doesn't make one more important than the other because they depend on each other. You can't have one without the other. So, Uh, where was I going with that? Anger, sadness, jealousy, alert to interference. That's how it's written because it's a fucking nerdy book. Um, oh, so, you know, you'd be scared if you thought there was a snake in the corner and you didn't know if it was poisonous or if there was a tiger right there or if there was a stranger with that looked angry at you and had a weapon. Like there's, there or a boar was looking at you, you know, angry boar, or aggressive, like mom with tusks that was like protecting somebody. Like, a threat to your survival, you feel it, you know? There's a, 
there's somebody that's coming up and rudely knocking on your door while you're parked at a light at night or something, or you're not, you're stopped at a light. You know, you feel that threat to your survival. You also feel a threat to your replication when your strategy for mating is threatened, which is a lot of, it's a lot of unsaid. There's a lot of unsaid um, attachments to what has been said in your relationship as you interact with people. Intimate relationships are so powerful for this because you don't really, there's not much motivation to work out so many details with just friends and platonic relationships. And with family, you just kind of get tired of it at some point. Like you don't need to work it out. You've just jockeyed yourself into a position. You're just trying to stay safe really because it's a bunch of toxic communication within families. You be forced to be around somebody for a long while all the time. You're going to develop a lot of weird, toxic, manipulative communication patterns that get a rise out of the other person. Because at some point you can, you stop using your muscles to move them around. You got to make them use their own muscles to move themselves around. You use emotions to do that. Emotions make people move around. So parents learn how to communicate in ways that moved your emotions to move yourself around. And that's what we do in relationships also, ideally, is through attraction. We move each other. Such that the withdrawal of attention becomes the only punishment. It's not really a punishment. You know, psychologically, this is kind of uh, separate from the, the show or the lecture or whatever, is just the energy of punishment is, is toxic, I think. That retribution or that punishing energy, I'm doing this because of them, so that they. And yet it, it is in some of our actions through in our responses. So this is a thing that I, it's a thing I look at internally. I'm looking for that, I almost call it like a resentment energy, but it's a punishing. There's, that's like the most accurate word I have for it right now is I'm trying to punish the other person. And when that happens, I relax. It doesn't necessarily mean I say or don't say whatever I was going to say. It's, uh, I just relax the energy, you know? And a lot of times my words change. So interference in one's mating strategy. Now, you know, it's been shown that women are more likely to cheat for emotional reasons than for physical, sexual reasons. It's not that she's looking to get off. She's looking to be more cared about and more appreciated. Conversely, he's not typically cheating because he needs some Uh, appreciation, you could call it, I could see how a man would say that, like she appreciates me. It's no, she is attracted to me. She displays attraction. You do too. It's, this is the, the basic duality of old girl, new girl, established relationship fling. She has that too, but she's doing it for oddly different reasons. She sees the wandering or the possibility because of more of a, for emotional reasons. He is so much bent on for physical reasons, the affair, that it's actually, it's just so different. And when it comes to uh, feeding positively, feed, positively feeding your relationships so that they go better in the duration, go back and look at what was the foundation, the bedrock of how you got together how did it transition? What were, the, what were the key checkpoints along the way? What was the flavor of those moments? What was the context? What was the frame? Like, meaning, how was, what was my role? What were our characters? How, would they, how were they interacting? What was the most divine expression of those characters and how they relate? Uh, it says the internet state is unstable, so I hope you heard all that. It's recorded on the computer anyway. But, you know, how were you to each other that's a, that is a foundation of the relationship that, that spark is, uh, seems to be a limitless fuel. Like you can keep tapping it, you know, 
because women, according to the statistics, they hope that their men will change, but they, the men aren't going to change because men can sire kids into their 80s, they say. They can have kids into their 80s. Give or take depends on many things, but that's a long time. Their reproductive period is a long time. They're not going to change that much throughout their time because how are their preferences really going to change? Maybe it'll be a little bit less risk-taking, a little bit more looking for a stable solution to the problem of I need to mate versus I don't need to look for a stable solution to my mating conundrum because I'm not yet fully developed in my mating potential. See, the man's value is much more able to mushroom you know, like an atomic bomb, just, whoa, got huge. His, va his value in the marketplace, in the mating market, is actually able to do that. Now, hers, she could do that like she got famous or something, just like if he did. But does, does that really give her access? It gives her access to celebrity men, but are celebrity men the best men to mate with? Do they have the highest survival? For example, the uh, studio owner... Who, who hires the actors, who produces or whatever. Who's the higher position, the studio head? Is that not more survival? What if they were a handsome studio head? Depends on how famous they are. You know, there are people that are maybe better mates. Now there's creativity and, you know, the, the aesthetic of being with an actor, whatever the fuck that is. It's just an example. But I'm just saying that uh, does that really increase a woman's mating value to become famous versus if she just became more beautiful? If she became more beautiful, more graceful, more elegant, more poised, more able to communicate, more useful, none of those things have anything to do with, the, can she mushroom? Well, she can grow. She can, now she, as she ages and matures, she can get expand her network. She gets wiser. She has experience. She still raises her value, but is she going to be able to like, uh, like a Donald Trump who knew about Donald Trump? There's a lot of people that are born to millionaires that go and you don't hear about him. He didn't go down. He went up, up, up or anybody that made it from nowhere. You know, Jay-Z, but then there's Beyonce, besides the fact that they're Illuminati baby eaters. But, uh, you know, where would Beyonce be if she hadn't married Jay-Z? Where are all the other Destiny Child? So, you know, men... They're playing a game of commitment. The ultimate investment, the last the Hail Mary that the man will play will be, I do everything for you. I'll give you this. I'll give you that. I'll buy you this. I'll buy you that. I'll do whatever you want, blah, blah, blah. It's commitment. I'm here to give resource, sap me of my resources in exchange for maybe exclusive access to your womb. Because it's the vagina, but that's just the feeling of sex. Like, it's really the womb in life. That's what's driving the genetic emotional engine. And then what's her thing is going to be? It could be all of that. I'll do anything, this and that, blah, 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 blah. But in the end, if she wants to tap into his genes, it's going to be something more like, there's nobody else for me. It's only you. I've removed everybody. I can't live without you. I need you. Not that I'll do anything for you, but that I'll need you. That's the difference. So the man would say, I'll do anything for you. The woman would say, I would need you. I need you. Now, the man can say, it's not that they can't say the opposites, but that's the core essence of survival and replication. Okay. So I think that's a lot of these notes, I think, are kind of off topic a little bit. You know, we already know a woman is only going to give birth to one man's child a, a per year. I mean, maybe she gets pregnant twice, three times. Who knows how many times she gets pregnant? But then she has to, that baby has to mature in the belly. 
fetus and then give birth, like it's going to be one per year. She can't really partition that up. He can partition it up. And that's in his nature. Okay, we don't, do we need to drive this point home? I don't know. That's just in the notes. <laughs> I take no responsibility. So people, they're going to avoid threats to their replication, their mating strategy. They're going to avoid threats just like they would avoid the snake in the corner or the rope in the corner that they think is a snake. If they think it's a snake, they will avoid it. You know, but what if it was, I don't know, the water hose you've been looking for or the rope or the belt you've been looking? What if it was that thing you were looking for and you're just afraid of a shadow in a, in a dimly lit corner? Lack of awareness. So I do these to spread awareness of myself and the agenda of what we do here at Base One Stoic Temple. And, you know, with the AZD and IMC process, what we're doing, integrating the wisdom of evolutionary psychology with the art and science of communication. How do you deliver these things? You try to talk for any amount of time and get people to listen over and over again. It takes practice. It's a thing. And, you know, relating with the audience is a really fun endeavor for me. So I really appreciate all the live audience. If you're catching this online, any of the uh, platforms, subscribe. And uh, let's see, we have some comments coming in. It's a long one. Long comment. Then you brought up Trump, Melania, Jay-Z, Beyonce, because through my research, understanding of spiritual loyalty, uh, things I told you about, I'm uh, full, uh, dark, my, mm -hmm. okay. Not a question, but yeah. And patterns is a big deal in this whole thing. You know, when you see the patterns of society and the, there are only so many strategies in society for mating and you see the patterns, you'll see maybe, maybe somewhat of the pattern you're in, you'll see an ability to step out of it. You'll see the nature that the genetic body is separate from the spirit body. You'll see, maybe even brush up with your own, uh, you'll trigger yourself on certain things. When you read about these ideas, when you see how women cheat and the strategies they go through, when you see all the deceitful tactics that men do that you yourself have done to more or less degree, not aware that at, if you extrapolate or forward pace, future pace that activity, it becomes more insidious, more sinister or more, more deceitful or more um, unethical in some way, more afraid, more operating out of fear, which she is too, right? And that's, that's very real on planet Earth. So understanding these things and seeing how the other person is behaving can clue us in a little bit more to how we're behaving because we're triggering behaviors in other people. But then they're bringing to the situation their perceptions. We don't know how they're thinking about what they're thinking about. So many times, you know, re reception might've gone out. And so I didn't hear that one uh, acknowledgement or the text. I read it in a wrong tone. And so I thought it meant something different, or there was a typing error, or you're in communication with somebody and not everybody has immaculate control of their voice. So it comes out, not always their first words is exactly what they mean. It's it, the sound of it exists. You know, we all have patterns of how we talk. And so when we start thinking about ideas that are like out of our experience, oh man, what is your relationship with the unknown? <coughs> What's your relationship with trying new things? What's your relationship with having a relationship you're unfamiliar with? What, men, what's your relationship with a woman that submits to you and is looking for you to tell her what to do? Not in a way that she can't figure it out for herself because she made it this far on her own. She's actually made it this far on her own and now sees you're so far ahead. She just wants you to now guide her by, by looking at you with puppy eyes for you to tell her the next thing. You didn't ask her to do that. You didn't tell her to do that. It just happened because of how you talk. Ladies, what's your relationship to being with a guy that you actually, you're afraid of losing him because you look up to him so much and you just don't know if you're worth it? Why you? What's your relationship with that feeling? Because that's, 
Is that really all that different than being in high school and wanting the superstar? And maybe getting with your dream boat once or twice in your life? Who knows? Women. 10 times. <laughs> Right. Okay. So I think that's the end. There's no questions. There's no comments. A bunch of people on. The basic, the basic is, uh, how does he assure his paternity? How does she assure the commitment? See, he. How is she going to guarantee that that's going to still be around in the future? I'm going to look different. I'm going to age. He's going to still be able to sire children. As he ages, is his preferences really going to change in what attracts him? Am I okay with with that? I mean, it's a reality of it. Do I want him to just control himself? Where am where am I as a woman controlling myself? And if it's I'm controlling myself because I have so many options, well, that might be a mismatch. Does he have so many options? Because what you see with a man that has options, with a woman that has options, is you'll see one of them cut out options for the other, or they just never make it anywhere. And who cuts out options? That's called submitting. Or abasing. And so when it comes to it, why would you cut out options? Well, he would cut out options because it's that's going to be a risk for his resources from her perspective. If he happens to get another woman pregnant, that's a lot of resources she's not going to get. If he happens to leave her for one of those other women that give her the admiration or attention that he wants, she just lost valuable years of her life because her rep reproduction window is not until 80. So that would be her interest in him cutting out options. Now, his interest in cutting out her options is so he ensures he's the dad. Because he can't prove that. That's going to be his genetic instinct. Right now, if she's using his options in women as a measure of if he's committed or not, well, what you can't trust him, and what happens to the male psychology given that he was designed to be able to partition his sexuality two or three times a day, every day, a month, every month, a year every year from 18 to 80 versus what happens to her psychology you know given 400 ovulation cycles a lifetime so what's going to be most uh conducive to survival well if she cuts out options. It should be for a man that she's looking up to, that she sees a better future with, that it would be better than holding those other options open and, you know, perhaps possibly exploring those options in her reproductive years. She has to weigh the latter half of her life plus whatever remains of her reproductive years against this one option. To be able to cut out other guys and feel good about it, it's got to measure up that you is greater than the sum of all other men. So that's a big difference you need to have. It's not just a little difference as a guy. Now for her, if he's going to cut out other options, it's very similar. You need to be so fine and out of access for him that he's willing to do that because it's very against his nature. And he's going to emotionally, genetically pay for that. It's going to punish him. And it's going to punish you too, because he's going to lose a little bit of self-esteem along the way because he gets that from female admiration and exercising that 
And so he'll look to you completely, utterly, 100% for all that affection he needs as a man. And you're going to go through your moods, your twice a month moods, and you're not going to feel like it. He's going to always feel like it. You're not going to feel like it. So gradually dissatisfaction and feeling like he's not appreciating or being, uh, you know, aware of my emotional state and this and that and bickering, internal bickering. Sex becomes less frequent, less enjoyable. And that's the state of monogamy. That's what happens in monogamy. But if you're real busy and you're out in rural America and he's always out on the farm or he's at war or whatever, and she's got a big family, he's given her a big family to take care of. And you got the farmhouse with like 72 people living there. That's probably, that's a really good strategy. It's a really good strategy. Monogamy is a really good strategy when you're just going to make babies like rabbits with your family on the farm. When you're around a lot of distractions and a lot of options, well, like I said, he can't ensure his paternity. How is she going to ensure his commitment? She needs to find an honest man. He needs to find a loyal woman. His psychology is going to urge, 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 urge him to cheat, not because she's not pretty, not because she's not loyal, not because she's not caring and nurturing, a great communicator, intelligent. It's going to urge him to cheat because it's going to urge him to reproduce with other women because that's going to urge him to do that because that's actually his nature. Like it's going to keep urging him. New is better for him. But guess what? After new, old becomes new again. It's renewed by getting with new. And that's a biological fact. I've talked about it a few times about the sperm count and how it's affected you know, when you're with a established relationship, you go with a new girl, get back with the established relationship, your sperm count jumps in both cases versus if you didn't get with a new girl, your sperm count. So it seems to be that life, organic life has favored the affair because it produces more sperm for the established relationship, given that there was a, a whole entire other ejaculation event before with a new woman. Life wants that. And then, of course, on his self-esteem and everything, and if he's pumped with self-esteem, then he's just going to fill her with self-esteem and vibrancy and, and talk good to her and treat her well and appreciate her. When he's in a negative self-esteem, he's going to find all the flaws in her and nagging and this and that. He puts it out, and then she reflects it back. A lot of problems are self-created by the man in the relationship, but that's because he has abased himself to monogamy, and that's against his nature. So he's feeling bad about that. He just doesn't know because nobody's taught him that, hey, that's against your nature. It's unnatural. Women everywhere like to talk about natural beauty, but they don't want a natural relationship where the man is set free and the woman is chained up, basically. Not as a slave or anything. That sounds really bad. That's going to be totally taken wrong. She's, she is making the home. He is on the hunt. When he's on the hunt, he, he spreads his seed if that happens but he brings the hunt home. Now, a super wealthy men, what they find is they establish second families without telling their first families. That's not so different than the king on the hunt and decides, oh, I'm going to take that wife as a wife here. This will be my local wife. Now, it's unfortunate. Why couldn't he just be honest? Why can't they just all be a bigger family? Oh, because of jealousy. And well, why? Why did you, because what do you feel threatened about? That's, that's the most interesting when we talk about like the mind control, the mass mind control of the human, of humanity. I wonder how much resistance a woman would have to that nature of human, of, of men. If she were raised in a, a tribe or a community where that were the norm. Where some men didn't mate and other men had multiple women. And the men who didn't mate probably took on more risks, but they didn't mate for a reason because they were smaller, dumber, weaker, broken, who knows, weird. The men who had multiple wives did so because they led, they survived battles. They were, they were emotionally stable. They knew how to lead and guide. And they proved it time and time again. Of course, who's, what, what's the woman going to mate with? One-on-one -on -one with that guy or three-on-one -on -one with that guy? How jealous am I going to be? Well, enough when, so I get a balance of attention. So I feel like I'm cared for, but also I'm going to be protective of the other women 
because that's my family too. And that hurts my family. Like at what point does it shift over to just some competitiveness between women? Like we were on MTV or something versus just core family values. Cause it's a tribe. Cause this is how it is. The world is brainwashed and this is how it really is. So that's a really fun psychological, uh, um, it's not an experiment, it's psychological exploration. The conversation back and forth with the women as a man, because from, from your perspective as a man, you're talking with a bunch of women throughout your life. From her perspective as a woman, she could think that way, but I like to think that what she thinks more is dropped that, drop that, drop that, drop that, drop that, now this man. And she just like forgets, she forgets the other men until she's dissatisfied. When she's really dissatisfied, she may open up those lines because those are going to be generally safer lines than to open up new lines. And safety is such a concern for her. But he never really closes those lines. That's not how he is. So, um, I mean, unless it was criminal activity. Because I have closed the line for criminal activity. Man, there was some really key thing there I was about to say. I was like right on the tip of it. Well, we'll just save it for the next episode. This has been really long. I doubt anybody on the recording listened to this whole thing, but it kept going. It was good, right? Man, there was a little extra little thing there. Wish I remember right now. You know, the back and forth, female, male. If you grew up in the tribe, how normal it would be. You know, the world will soak you, will suck you back into its illusion of how things should be. But looking around, nobody seems to be that happy with how it is. They stop trying. And I think there seems to be some expectation or unconscious expectation on the matter that you should stop trying at some point. That at some point you'll get to the place where you can stop trying. And I don't like that for myself. I don't want that for myself. Maybe it just happens with age. We get tired of trying. I don't know. The examples that I see in life, I don't see that. I see that most people, they stop trying, but that doesn't mean that's, that's the natural thing just because it's the common thing. The common thing isn't the natural thing. In fact, it's natural is a lot of times it's uncommon, I think. So with that, I'll sign off from myself to you. Namaste.